so far in the course, we've talked about application level things, right? We talked about the relational model, we talked about the normal forms, we talked about SQL, right? These are all the things, if you're a application programmer, that you have to deal with in your application. And so now at this point in the course, now we're switching over to actually now talk about how do you actually build a database system that's going to you know, manage the database and do all the things that we talked about before. How, do we, how are we going to execute SQL? How are we going to execute uh, and load data into our database and make sure everything's safe? So we sort of covered this. This is the course outline uh, that I showed at the beginning of the class. We sort of covered the first part. We covered relational databases. Everyone should know what, you know, at a high level what relational model is. And then now we're sort of going down this, this outline here and essentially talking about all the different parts of a database system you need to build in order to have, you know, something that you could call a database system. And so the way to sort of think about the database system is that it's a bunch of layers uh, on top of each other that provide different abstractions or APIs to other different parts, right? So at the very top, you have the query planning. This is where the SQL query comes in. And then you turn your query plan into a relational algebra query plan tree, and then, you, and then you execute them. And those things that execute the queries actually need to read data. Then those are your access methods, and those access methods need to read data from disk, and that's your buffer pool manager and disk manager. So the sort of pipeline of, or the, 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 the hierarchy of how query execute is going from the top bottom in my diagram here, but we're going to start from the bottom and go up. Right, today, we're really going to talk about how do you actually store database, right, a database on disk and, and manage that. So the, this course is, is focused on what I'll call a disk-oriented uh, database system architecture. And by the definition I'll give you for a disk-oriented system is one where the database system assumes that the primary storage location of the database is on disk. Right? And that means that the, essentially the, all the different components of the database system have to account for the fact that at, at any given time, you could be trying to access data that's not in memory, and therefore it's on disk, and therefore you have to go copy it into to disk and bring it into memory. Uh, and so it's really about this trade-off of how can, we, uh, how can we have the appearance in our database system that everything's in memory, even though it's not. Right? And the reason why we have, we have this issue is because if we store things in DRAM or in memory, it's volatile. If you, meaning if you pull the plug, everything gets, 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 you lose everything. And the disk is non-volatile storage, meaning we can write stuff to it if, we, if we're careful about it, and we can come back later after we restart the machine or if someone trips over the power cord or whatever, and our data should still be there. All right, it's not, you know, disk and everything aren't magical. You have to use them correctly, otherwise you could lose stuff, and you have to make sure we order our writes correctly. Uh, but that's the kind of thing we'll be covering in this course. And so to understand this, uh, we want to go first discuss what the storage hierarchy looks like. And so again, the way to sort of think of this is going from the bottom to the top. The bottom you have uh, slower devices, but are, have much larger storage capacities. And then as you go up, you get to faster de storage devices, but you have much, much smaller capacity. And implicit in this is that the things at the top are really, really expensive, and things at the bottom are, are cheaper. And so, again, it's this trade-off of trying to decide how do you manage, uh, you know, how do you manage the movement of, of, from the different layers. So the division line that we're going to care about as we design our database system is sort of right here, as, as I'm showing, in between the DRAM and, and SSD. So the things above this line are volatile storage devices. And again, I said that means if you write something to it and then you pull the plug on the power, everything goes away. And the reason why they're volatile is because the way these, this, you know, DRAM and all these things work is that you, you know, periodically have to give it energy, give it power, so that it retains the ones and zeros that you're storing in it. The things below that are non-volatile storage. And again, these are sort of passive devices where you can write to them. And then if you pull the power, you can come back and everything's still there. But there's actually other two, two characteristics about these two different classes of storage devices that we're going to care about. And it's actually going to come up throughout the semester uh, in how we design our algorithms and different database components. So the first is that the things at the top, the, not, the volatile storage devices, these support what are, what's called random access, meaning you can address to a single byte or you know, a, a single cache line and grab individual elements in, in, in storage. Um, contrast that with a, uh, the, the, the non-volatile non storage devices, these are, these are considered block addressable, 
I mean, you can't go get a single, just a single thing. Uh, I mean, you can, but the, the, the hardware or the device is actually going to go get a bunch of things all at once, a block or a page. Right? So, I, so at the top, I can access a you know, single 64-bit integer. At the bottom, if I want a single 64-bit integer, I've got to go fetch a 4-kilobyte page. Then I jump to the offset that has the data that I'm looking for. The other important aspect about this is that the things at the top, sort of related to that, they're byte addressable, but it also means that they support random access. Right? I can go grab the single things that I want. Uh, whereas the bottom, typically these devices want you to do what's called sequential access, meaning I want to grab a bunch of data that's all stored contiguously in the storage device so that it's one fetch to go get the thing I need or, or, or continuous fetches. This is mostly an issue in old sort of spinning disk hard drives, right? Because there's a mechanical arm that has to jump to different parts of the platter and you start reading data off, off of, off of, off of the, the, you know, the spinning disk. And so if you're doing random access and jumping to different locations on the platter, then it's a physical movement of the arm, right? It, it sort of swings around and jumps around and has to copy out four kilobyte bo blocks every single time uh, you do a different seek. Whereas in DRAM, it, uh, you don't really have to do this. In SSDs, uh, they, they're sort of a hybrid between two, two. If you do a sequential access within four, kil four kilobyte page, that's good. Uh, beyond that, you don't see that big of an improvement as you do in a spinning disk hard drive. So I think the book also, too, the, the textbook might show you this, this sort of same hierarchy. And at the bottom, instead of putting what I'll call network stores, they'll put like magnetic tapes. Right? This is like old, like old technology of doing like tape archives. Uh, this is mainly, you know, you, Amazon will, will sell you a service called Amazon Glacier, which is basically the same kind of thing. But this is really for archival stuff. Like if, if there's a complete disaster, you go back to your tape archives and you have a machine that you have to, you know, to walk into the shelf and pull it off and put it in, right? It's, it's a really long latency. So by network storage here, I mean something like Amazon S3 or Amazon EBS, right? It's, it's underneath the covers, those different services are using uh, spinning disk hard drives or SSDs. But because there's a network latency to go get the data that you need, uh, they're going to be slower than these other devices. OK, so the, for our purposes in this course, uh, we're going to consider DRAM as just memory. All right, anytime I say memory in the course, I really just mean DRAM. And then when I say disk, I mean any, any three of these things at the bottom. right? SSD, spinning disk hard drives, or network storage. And so, again, for our purpose in, in this class, we're really focused on how can we manage the movement of data from, from disk up to, up to memory, right? And we said that the database is going to assume the primary storage location of, of, of all the data will be down here at the bottom. So it's really about us copying things back and forth. Now, some advanced systems can get kind of clever and actually start worrying about how you store things in CPU registers or CPU caches. We're not going to cover that at all here. Uh, and part of the reason is because you know, if everything's on disk, uh, then trying to be really smart about getting things in CPU caches is not going to be a huge, huge win, because the disk is always going to be the, the slowest thing. In the class in the spring, we, we're going to assume the database is going to be in memory, not on disk. And therefore, doing these, you know, managing these things at the top actually uh, makes a big difference. But we're not, really, we're not going to talk about that too much in this class. Another thing that I just want to mention uh, that is coming, but we won't cover in this class either, is this new storage technology is called non-volatile memory, which is sort of this weird hybrid thing that sort of spans in between the two of them. Right? Non-volatile memory, sometimes they call it phase change memory or memristors, resistive RAM. They have a bunch of different technology names. The, the basic idea is that you're going to get the best of both worlds. You're going to be able to, to access it uh, on you know, random bytes uh, like you would with DRAM and be almost as fast as DRAM, but it's going to have the durability of an SSD or a spinning disk hard drive. So that, that's actually a big deal, uh, and it really changes a lot about how you actually design a database system. And this is actually what the research uh, Joy's been working on for his PhD thesis. And so for this course, we're not going to focus on this now because this actually doesn't exist yet. Uh, you can't go buy it online anywhere, um, but depending what, who you talk to, it might actually come out in 2018. But in the meantime, uh, DRAM's not going away. SSDs and spinning disk hard drives aren't going away. So we're not going to worry about too much there. But at some point, maybe 10 years from now, we might throw away everything we do in this course and actually teach, to, teach you to use non-volatile memory. All right, so the goal of what we're trying to talk about today is 
because the database is assumed to be on disk, then we means we can support databases that are larger than the amount of memory that's available to the system. So if I have a one gigabyte uh, stick of DRAM in my machine, I can have a 10 gigabyte database. Right? If you have an in-memory database, it has to fit in, in DRAM, so you, you, you couldn't go, go larger than that. So again, everything we're, we're going to be talking about for the next two, two lectures is really about how do we read and write data uh, on disk and manage the movement of, memory, uh, movement of data back and forth between disk and the memory. So if I say that we, we want to have the illusion of a system that has more memory than it actually has, what does that sound like? What's that? Say, say, say it louder, sorry. Virtual memory, exactly, right. So the way virtual memory works is that you sort of have this swap area on disk, and it's the, the operating system is allowed to move data back and forth between disk and memory to give the illusion that your system has more RAM than it actually does. So maybe this is actually something we want to use, right? Maybe, maybe we want to let the OS actually manage our memory for, the operating, for our database system because it can already do this sort of the same thing with virtual memory. Who thinks this is a good idea or a bad idea? Not a good idea. Not a good idea. Why? Because uh, if you rely on the operating systems, you have less choice on your design space. Right. So he says if you, let, if you rely on the operating system, uh, then you have less choice in your design space inside the database system. Right? So he's correct. But let's understand why. So here, 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 here knows what MMAP is, the syscall. One, two, a couple. All right. So MMAP is called, is, it stands for memory map files. And the way this basically works, it allows you to take a file that you have on your disk, right, that's going to be broken up into pages, and you'll be able to map them into the address space of your process. And then any time you jump in memory and try to access something within uh, you know, uh, the location of that file, if it's in memory, you just access it. If it's not in memory, then you get a page fault, and it goes and fetches your, 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 the page you're trying to access and brings it into memory. Right? So it sort of looks like this. Here we have it our on-disk on file. Say it really simple. I have four pages. And then I have my virtual memory and physical memory. So with virtual memory, again, I can, I can allocate all four pages, even though there's actually nothing in there yet. But in physical memory, I only have two pages. So if my database system comes along and accesses a tuple in this page, uh, it's not memory. So the OS will go copy it, but it copies it into the physical memory location, and then just maps the, the, the virtual memory page to point to the physical memory page. So this is fine. Uh, but then now I access page three, does the same thing. Uh, it goes and fetches the data that I need. But now let's say I, I access page two. What happens here? Right, you, you have to replace one of the pages that are in physical memory, right? But which one? What does Linux do? What's that? Yeah, he said LRU. I actually looked it up yesterday. It's not LRU, it's LRU-like. It's clock, which we'll cover on Wednesday. But I think a more important thing, not just like, oh, that has to go you know, pick one actually to swap out, it's actually going to put your process to sleep. And actually, it did that for all the, all the pages it had to touch that weren't in memory. When it tried to touch a page that wasn't there, the OS blocks your process because you hit a page fault, which is an interrupt. And then the operating system goes, touches the page you need. And then once it, it's now in, in physical memory and it does the mapping to, through virtual memory, then you get control back on, on your process. Right? So for you know, regular applications, like you know, say you're building Photoshop or something on, you know, on, on something you know, run on, on your laptop, blocking your process is not a big deal, right? Because you go to disk, you got to go to disk anyway, who cares? But in a database system, when we start talking about concurrency and all these other things, this is going to be a big, big problem. Because the, the, the process that got blocked when it hit a page fault may actually be holding locks to other tuples or other latches to other, other data structures. And the, now you'd be blocking for a long time, and all, all these other uh, threads that are running other, other queries and other transactions could be doing useful work, but they can't because you're holding all the locks. So just to give you an idea how long these stalls actually can be, I think it's important to understand what the access times are for these different storage devices that I showed in that hierarchy. Right, so the, so the, the fastest storage device you can have is L1 cache, and, we, and a typical system can access this in a half a nanosecond. 
And then as you go down, 7 nanoseconds for L2, 100 nanoseconds for DRAM. For the SSDs and spinning disk hard drives, spinning disk hard drives are always the same, whether it's a read and write. For SSDs, it's, it's faster to do reads versus writes. And then we get down to the network storage, and this is a range, you know, Amazon roughly says 20 to 40, 40 milliseconds on EBS. And then, again, the, the example I said that was the worst case is the tape archive. It's where, you know, somebody actually has to go put the tape into the machine. You, they have robots that do these things, but uh, even then, it gets, it's a mechanical process and it's really, really slow. So it's sort of hard to wrap around these numbers because we're, we're, we're discussing them in, in terms of nanoseconds, right? But let's say instead of nanoseconds, we just said seconds. And now you can see, now I start to understand why stalling the thread while you go fetch something from disk is a really bad idea, right? So we say one nanosecond equals now one second. If I have to go to my hard drive to go get something, that's equivalent of less, like in real time, going, you know, waiting six, 16 weeks to go get something. So going fetching things from non-volatile storage is really, really bad and really, really slow. So we want to avoid this at all cost. And they, but in the case, you know, this is unavoidable sometimes, so sometimes we do have to go to disk. And so if we're going to go, uh, you know, if, if we're going to go be blocked for 16 weeks, ideally we want that thread to be able to do other stuff or have, you know, not hold locks and other things that block other guys from making forward progress. So this is why, uh, so now you may say, all right, well, maybe the way to solve this is actually now to, to just have multiple threads. Right? Assume that we build a sort of a straw man database system with MMAP and we only have a single thread and it's the only thing reading and writing. And so, yeah, if it has to stall, then, you know, the, the, nobody else will be worried about the locks that it has or, uh, but that makes it look bad because now anytime you run a query and you go to get, 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 get something from disk, there's a long pause while you go fetch everything. So the system looks unresponsive. So now you can say, well, maybe I have multiple threads so I can mask all this. Again, now where things get e even more complicated because at no point you know, you don't know whether something's in memory or not. That's the whole point of MMAP. The operating system is hiding this from you. So it's unlike when you build your buffer pool manager, when you go try to access a page, you'll know whether that page is in memory or not. And then based on whether it's in memory or not, you can make decisions about what should you actually do for that thread. If you, and it's hard to do that in a, uh, when you're using MMAP because the operating system is hiding everything for you. So, this is going to come up multiple times throughout the semester. Um, and if I die, you can put it on my, on my tombstone. But the bottom line is you never want to use MMAP for your database system. Uh, there are rare occasions where it actually makes sense. We had the InfluxDB guy give a talk on, uh, on Thursday last week. And he's like, yeah, we use MMAP. And at first I was like, oh, that sounds like a bad idea. But then what he told me is how he's actually using it, it's OK, because they're not actually writing data using MMAP. They're just reading data. And in that case, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you're read-only, you don't have a problem. If you have to write things, then MMAP is going to be a bad idea. And as he sort of brought up uh, when I asked this earlier, by letting the operating system d manage our memory for us, we're giving up the opportunity to do a bunch of optimizations and control the, actually how the system is going to work. So uh, I talked about buffer replacement policy, how you decide what page to move out. But now if you know you're going to have a query scanning a bunch of pages, maybe you can do prefetching. Um, and, and bring things in memory ahead of time because you know you're going to keep going down uh, the list. We care about thread and process scheduling. And we care about when we talk about recovery and transactions, we're going to care about when we actually flush data to the disk. So my example before, again, I just read things in and let the OS swap in things, things in and out. But now if I want to modify the, the file, I want to make sure that it, it actually makes it, make it, makes it out the disk in a safe manner. So this is not... So this idea that the operating system is going to be a problem for us as a database system is not new. It goes back, uh, there's a paper from 1980 uh, written by Mike Stonebreaker where he talks about how the operating system gets in the way from a database system. And the bottom line is that the mantra from the, for if you're going to be a database system developer is that the operating system is not your friend, it's your enemy, and is always going to get in the way. So we try to avoid it as much as possible. And so that means that we end up having to build sort of operating system-like things in our database system. We have to build a thread scheduler. We have to build a, a buffer pool manager. But the database system always knows better than the operating system because it knows exactly what your data looks like and it knows exactly what queries you're trying to execute on it. So it can make the best decision about all of these things, not the operating system. So again, the operating system is not your friend. Okay. So given that setup, now we want to actually talk about how 
how we actually store, store our database on disk. Um, and there's essentially two problems to do this. There are two problems we have to deal with. The first is just how, we, how are we going to represent the data on, on files on our disk? Um, and then the second question is, how is the data system going to manage its memory and move data back and forth right, at, as needed based on what queries you execute? So for today's class, we're going to focus on the first problem. The, the second problem we'll focus on, on, on Wednesday, and this is also related to uh, the, the first project that we're giving you. Right? In, in, the, in the project, we give you the source code that, that'll, that'll do this first one for you. So another important thing that we need to sort of address, and I mentioned this earlier when we talked about the hierarchy, is that uh, traditionally database systems make a big deal about preferring uh, algorithms and data structures and components that try to maximize the amount of sequential access to disk. Again, this is because on a spinning disk hard drive, the, moving the arm is a mechanical thing, so if you can move it once and read a lot of data, you'll get much, much better, better performance. Um, and so as we go along, you'll see a lot of the algorithms that we'll discuss care about this and, and make decisions to do this. Right? Basically allocating a bunch of pages together on, on a storage device that are contiguous is called an extent. And I think the POSIX API uh, provides you uh, support to do this. So again, as I said, nowadays, if you have fast random access, either with SSDs or non-local memory or on, on DRAM, then this is not entirely necessary. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff, this is what we, we'll be focusing on in the advanced class in the spring, 15721. And so again, so the way to think about it is this course is a traditional disk-oriented database system. Most systems that you think of when you think of a database system is, is this, right? Postgres, Oracle, MySQL, uh, DB2, SQL Server. All these are disk-oriented systems that we're talking about today. And then the more modern or advanced state-of-the-art systems will be the in-memory guys. All right, so for today's agenda, we're going to focus on four parts. Uh, we're first going to deal with how we actually organize our database uh, as a bunch of pages and files. Then we're going to talk about how do you actually represent or organize the contents of these pages and keep track of where do you have free space or not. Uh, and then we're going to talk about how do you actually lay out the tuples inside of these pages. And then hopefully, if we have enough time, we'll finish up talking about uh, sort of a, a more advanced topic that's not in the textbook, but how do you, the different storage models you can have in, in your databases. OK, so in the most basic form, the, the database management system is essentially going to store the a database is a bunch of files on disk. Right? Some systems have, have a single file, like SQLite. Some systems, or most systems, will actually store multiple files. Uh, and sometimes, usually, it's inherent in the hierarchy of the directories of, of, of the layout of, of the actual database. So the, this means that the operating system doesn't know anything about our database files. Right? Just, they look like regular files, that, like any, any other file. Right? It's only the, the database management system is, is able to actually decipher their contents and extract meaning from them and, and actually show your data. So again, when you try to open up a text editor of, of a Postgres file or a MySQL file, you're just going to see a bunch of bytes because they don't mean anything. You need the database system to, to actually interpret it. And so this means that because they're just regular files in the file system, all the normal protections that, a, that the file system provides like journaling and other things, they'll be available to our, to our file system, to our, to our database, database files. And that's sort of another example of where the OS is sort of getting in our way. And, you know, the database system is going to do its own journaling, its own logging, right, to, when it makes changes to be able to recover from them. But now the operating system is essentially going to do the same thing, right, to make sure your files are okay. So you may think, all right, well, just, why not just get rid of, rid of the file system entirely and, and make a sort of a specialized database file system? Uh, that only my database system knows how to read and write files from. Uh, and I would say this is actually how the first database systems in the 1980s all did this. Right? They all said whatever the file system that Unix or, or, or Vax that provided, they thought they were all crap. And then what they read, did instead was they would allocate a, a bunch of a block of bytes directly from the storage device and sort of build their own storage subsystem on top of that. Uh, but nobody does this anymore because it's a lot of engineering. And although the file systems aren't great, they're good enough for what we want. Yes? The Right. So his statement is the the operating system is journaling the um, the metadata about files, whereas the data system is 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 journaling the or logging the the, the data about the contents. 
Correct. But the point I just want to make is that uh, sort of so what I said just now is you could, there's no reason we have to use ext4, ext3, those file systems. The earlier systems actually built their own file system like thing that did all the stuff for you. That didn't, so you didn't have to sort of have sort of these redundant, redundant you know, logging, things like that. But nobody does that anymore because it's a, it's a huge pain. It makes your system not portable. And then roughly the performance, the performance gain you'll get from is like 10%. So, so nobody builds their own file system. Everyone just uses what, what's already there. It's good enough, All right? Uh, right, okay. So now the thing we're talking about here is usually called the storage manager, right? And, it, and again, it's, it's the thing that's responsible for managing the database, database files on disk. And the way it's going to sort of organize the, the, the files or the data in the files is through pages. Right? So another thing, too, is also sometimes I'll say block, sometimes I'll say page. I essentially mean the same thing, right? Some chunk of bytes that are, that's going to be stored in, in our file. And so the storage manager is responsible for keeping track of all the data that's read and written from these pages. Uh, and it has to track the available space in each page so that if you need to write new data, it, it knows you know, some location where it actually can store this data. So for now, we're only going to focus on reading and writing tuples to our pages. But all the same, same, same things that we're talking about in this class will, will come up again when we talk about you know, writing out index files or log files and other things, right? All, for, keep it simple. We're only talking about tuple pages. But there's other different types of pages that you have to maintain as well. But we want to have the same protections that we have for, for data pages. So a page, again, is essentially just a fixed size block. And again, it, it can contain sort of any amount of data. Um, Typically, most systems, as far as I know, do not mix page types. So you have, if you have one page that stores only tuple, that stores tuples, you won't sort of sprinkle in log records, right? You keep those, those things separate. And we do that because it's, it's, it's easier to, to, to build the software to maintain these things. Um, some systems also require that the, uh, the pages have to be self-contained. So what, what I mean by that is all the information you need about the data that's stored in the page has to be contained in that page. So, for example, say you were using a um, sort of a, a, a dictionary where you, you could map you know, va uh, string values to integers, and that way, instead of storing string values inside the page, you just store integers, right? Sort of a basic compression scheme. If uh, if the if the dictionary is stored on one page and the data is stored on another page, if somehow the harbor gets corrupted and that dictionary page gets gets blown away then you have no way to restore, restore the original data because you don't know how to, how to reverse the dictionary encoding. Right? So systems like Oracle, for example, they require that all the information you need to be able to recover a page is stored within that page. And the reason why they do this is because the, the worst thing you have to do as a DBA is often go look at a bunch of pages on, on a, you know, a, a messed up disk and try to you know, extract any, recover any data that you can. And that means you're looking at raw bits to figure out what the, what's in the page header, what's actually being stored. So if you have everything be uh, self-contained, then it becomes less brittle, meaning you can, you can lose one page and it doesn't reverberate and blow away all the other pages. So every page is going to be given a unique identifier, um, and the data system is going to use sort of an additional indirection layer to map a page to an actual physical location on disk. So that could be some directory, it could be some file, or somehow there's an internal map, it doesn't really matter what it is, uh, that's going to map the page ID to some location on disk. All right, so one thing we had to talk about is that there's different notions of pages in when we're dealing with the database system. Right, so at the lowest level in the actual storage device, you have what's called a hardware page. And this varies per, per vendor, but usually it's, it's about four kilobytes. And so when I say, uh, again, by a hardware page, I sort of mean that this is what the hardware can guarantee will be an atomic write to that storage device. So meaning, like, if I, if I, if I write a 4K block, the, 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 the drive will come back and say, I wrote that 4K block, and it's guaranteed to, you know, if it says it, it was there, it's there. If I try to write sort of 8K blocks, or, uh, it may only be able to write the first one and then crash and then not have the second one. So it can't be an atomic write. Then we have the operating system pages. And again, this is sort of what it, how it maps things in, in memory. By default, in Linux and Windows, it uses 4K light pages. 
uh, but there are options to use larger pages. And the, the advantage of using larger pages is that now you have the, the, the TLB or the, 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 the mapping from virtual memory to physical memory can be much smaller. You can, you can, you can reference more, more locations in memory with a smaller table if you use larger pages. By, but by default, they're 4K. And for our purposes in this class, we're not going to mess with that. We can, dis we can discuss that in the advanced class later. And then we have our database pages. So the database page does not necessarily need to be a one-to-one -one mapping to the OS page or the hardware page. Different database systems do different things. So at, at, at the smallest range, you have like SQLite that does one kilobyte pages. And then Oracle and DB2 are 4K, SQL Server and Postgres are 8K, and MySQL is 16K. Right? And so there's no right or wrong answer for what page size you can do. But what I'll say is that uh, if you're using a page size that's larger than what the OS and the operating system can guarantee can be a fail-safe write or be atomic write, then you have to do a bunch of extra, extra stuff to account for that because you don't want torn updates. So in the case of MySQL, when we talk about logging, we'll see that what they actually do is when they flush out uh, dirty pages, uh, then you know, pages have been modified by transactions and queries, and you want to write them out to the actual disk, the database on disk, it actually writes them to a double write back buffer first, d sequentially, and then once that's durable, then it actually goes and updates the actual real database pages. Right? They have to do this because they can't guarantee that the, 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 the write will be atomic at, at 16K. Okay, so now also we need to put the, the note also that every... Uh, Every record or every tuple in the database is going to have a record ID. Um, so this is essentially some unique identifier that the database system, database system is going to assign to a tuple that allows it to, to track it in its internal bookkeeping mechanisms. Right? And usually the most common thing that everyone does is that you'll set the, 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 the tuple ID to be a combination of the page ID and the offset or slot. I, you know, the page ID tells you where on disk it is, and the offset or slot tells you at what offset to jump to find the actual data you're looking for. Uh, so some systems, like in, in Oracle, for example, they have really big uh, row IDs uh, that are 10 bytes, and this is because they're storing um, a bunch of information about where, what file is located in, uh, what directory it's in, what table space it's in, and they sort of embed all this in the row ID. So in some systems, these are actually stored in line with the tuple itself, in other systems, these are simply derived, right? And it's important to note that the, the, although you can see this in your application, you don't actually want to do anything with it because it's not reliable. Because the relational model doesn't say anything about the position of tuples on physical storage. The data system can move any tuple around at once, and then all these row IDs will change. So let's see that. If we, I can give you a quick demo of what this looks like. And bear with me, because this is oh, awesome. This is trying to run SSH inside, inside of a Windows, which is never fun. <coughs> nope. Oh, like you guys never typed a password wrong. OK. OK, um, all right, so this is Postgres. So uh, I think I have a table here, R, right? So let me, let me recreate this. Drop table, R. Oh. All right, and then uh, we'll create it. And then we'll insert a bunch of tuples. Right? So now I do select star from R. And I have, I have three tuples. So in, in Postgres, what you can do is you add in a, what they call it the CT, CTID, which is the, the tuple identifier. Right? And then I'll do r.star. So now in my output, for this table, I see now I have this CTID, and now it's now you see it's exactly what I talked about before, how it was a, a combination of the page ID 
and the offset. Right? So the zero is probably the page number, and then the offset one, two, three is, is the offset for this tuple. Right? So now let's say I delete a tuple, right? delete from R, where I'll delete the middle guy, where ID equals two. Right? And now let's say I insert a new tuple, insert into R values four and then XXX. All right. So who says now when I say, give me, give me the, the, the internal ID for this tuple, I just deleted the second tuple with that position 0, 2. Now I just inserted another tuple. Where do you think it's going to be stored? 0, 4? 0, 4. Right? So internally, Postgres knows there's a hole there, but it preferred to actually use it the, the next slot. So we're not going to discuss what uh, the vacuum is just right now, but think of this, the vacuum as like the, almost the, I'm going to say dis defrag, but the defrag for the database system in Postgres. It's going to go through all our pages and prune out all the, uh, the, the old stuff that's not needed anymore and, and possibly reorganize stuff. So now when I go back, right, and I do that same query on the same data, now the row ID has, has changed, right? Now the third record is at two, and then the, uh, the fourth record, which used to be at four, is now at three. So this is an example that the row ID will be exposed to you in your application, uh, but the, the, the database system is allowed to do whatever it wants to reorganize things, uh, at any time. So you never want to build your application assuming that, that this thing is, is unique or always going to be the same because at any, any moment it, could, it could, can move things around. And again, this is allowed in the relational model because the relational model doesn't say anything about how data is actually stored. Yes? Wait, just, so, so the question is, if you use the, if you, you're talking about Postgres in particular? If, if, so if you, if you use the Postgres vacuum, can you do what, sorry? Can you actually refer to uh, Drupal by the exact address? His question is, if, if, you use, if you use the vacuum, can you refer to the tuple as, as the exact address? Yeah, so like if it's zero, one, like if it's one, three, four, earlier, and then it's... Then it got reorganized. One, two, three. Yes. Who, who, so who's you? The application or the data system? The, the, application. the application doesn't know anything. So I think a different way to fix that question would be, can you actually like select that tuple using the underlying oh. location? Oh. Yeah. I think that's one possible. Let's find out. So his question is, so here I'm just showing a select query where I'm, I'm just getting the CTID. And again, this is an internal thing that, that Postgres is, is maintaining. His question is, can I do my query now and say where CTID equals something? Um, like yeah, let's see if that happens. Um, it's not going to like this. Oh. Let's see whether I cast it correctly. Oh, I did it. Okay. So, but don't do that, <laughs> right? Uh, in, we have the same thing also in SQLite. Um, right, I'll, I'll create the same table. I'll load a bunch of data. And then in SQLite, they call it, I think, row num, row ID, right? So the same thing, one, one, one two, three. Um, and then the question is, can we, can we do where row ID equals one? Who says yes? Who says no? Raise your hand yes. Raise your hand no. One. Let's you do it. All right? So again, I just want to show you that this is, this is like, when I defined my schema, I, never, I didn't say there was row, row ID or CTID. The database system is going to do this internally for us, right?
All right, let's see. <sighs> okay, and something worked in Windows. That's great. Okay. Uh, okay, so now we want to talk about how we're actually going to uh, manage our pages. And this is where the, the data systems are, are going to differ a lot. More than just how, you know, how many, what the page size is and things like that. Actually, internally, how they're going to manage the, the, the keep track of pages uh, will be really different. So I'm going to focus on the, the first one and the last one. Uh, for the sequential assorted file organization and the hashing files, that will come up, I think, next week when we start talking about index data structures and things like that. Um, the heap file is sort of a, a, a generic approach to doing this. And then the, the log structure file organization is sort of the wild card in all of this. Uh, that's, I don't think it's in the textbook at all. Uh, but this is actually not a new idea, but it's actually showing up in, in, in a lot of newer systems. So I think it's worth discussing a little bit. And again, it'll deviate a lot from how we're talking about storing tuples and pages. Uh, but I think the, at a high level, you should be able to follow it. All right, so a heap file is a unordered collection of pages that the data system is going to use to, to store, store things. Um, and the only thing that the data system needs to guarantee with its heap file is that the other components of the system, that the, the things that could be accessing data, they just need to be able to scan through it and, and find, find all the tuples it needs. Right? It makes no guarantees about how things are sorted. It makes no guarantees about that you can jump to a particular offset and always find the thing you're looking for. Uh, think of this as that we're dealing with, I, if, if I need page 5, I know how to find it in my heap file. So there's two ways to represent this. Uh, the first is the linked list, which is sort of the, the straw man that they, every textbook, textbook discusses, uh, but no, nobody actually does this. And then the more common one is, is the page directory. So in the link list, essentially, the, the, there'll be some special page in our file, um, that the heap file, that's going to keep track of two pointers. The first will be a pointer to a link list that's called the, the data page, uh, da data page list. And these are the pages where uh, they're completely full of, of, of tuples. We can't store anything, anything new in there. And then the other pointer would be to the free page list where there's at least one slot in the page where we could actually store data, right? And so that means that if you need to scan everything, you get to traverse both lists. Uh, they usually have pointers going in both directions because uh, you, you need to walk back and forth. Um, and then if you, if you can't, if the free page is empty and the free page list is empty, you just allocate new pages and append it to the end of that list, right? So what are two obvious problems in this? Right? It seems really inefficient because you're just you're walking through this linked list. Uh, the, so that, that's sort of obvious. The second problem is that where do we actually store the data for how much space is available in each page? Because right? the header page that I said just has pointers. Right? So the, if I need to store a tuple that's kind of really big, I ideally want to find a page that has enough space for me. So I need to embed it now in the, in, in the actual data pages themselves. That means I have to walk that list every time to find a slot that can, can, can handle the tuple that I want to insert into it, right? And so you have to store this inside the pages because you want all the same protections you have for regular data because if you have additional metadata about the pages that are stored in some in-memory data structure, like how much free space is in the page, then when you crash, you turn the system off and come back, now you need to scan through all your pages and, and count how much space they have and repopulate that data structure, right? So a, a better alternative is called the page directory or the page table. And essentially what this is is just a, um, there's sort of a hash table at the, at, or directory that's going to map uh, page IDs to the actual locations in a file where, where they can be found. And then what you'll do now also, too, is actually embed the amount of free space that's available in each page in the page directory itself. So if you need to say, I need to find something new, then you can go look in directly in those page directories and, and, and say, well, here's a page that, that can accommodate me. Right? And again, it's important that the data system makes sure that the, the, the 
the directory pages are always in sync with the data pages, right? Because again, you don't want the problem where you don't, you don't have the problem where I write something out to a data page and therefore I use all its space, but then I haven't updated that free space in the in the directory page, and therefore when you come back, that's it's out of sync. So anytime we, we modify or update the contents of a data page in terms of changing how much space is allocated to it, we also need to update the, the directory page. And anytime we allocate a new data page, we have to update the directory page as well. So this is not that, I mean, it's, it's not that big of a deal or big of a problem because we don't create pages that often, right? In, in terms of like, if I, ins I can insert a lot of tuples and they can all go on the same page, it's not like I need to allocate a new page for every single tuple most of the time. Um, so flushing out the directory page every single time we update the, the number of entries is, uh, is, is not that big of a deal. But we need to make sure that they're always in sync. So the thing that's slightly different from all of this, uh, from, from uh, the heap file, so I would say also too is like going forth in the class, we're going to be, we're going to assume that we have a heap file using the page directory architecture. Yes? His question is, uh, are pages just location in a file? In the most simple form, yes. All right, but they could be in, broken up into different files. Right, I think in, if you look at Postgres, for example, if you just look at like var lib Postgres and like look at all the directories, there's all different files for like the page directory, for indexes, for data pages, for different tables and everything. All right, but at its most simple form, yes, a pa the page directory is like, it's this file and here's the offset to go get it. Right? And this is why we have to have fixed size pages because that way we can jump, you know, we know how to do the calculation and arithmetic to jump to the, the location we want for a given offset because all the pages will be the same size. All right, so uh, again, a as I said, for this class going forward, we're going to assume we're going to use heap files with, with the, the page directory layout, right? Because again, most data systems are built like that. But I want to discuss a little bit, a completely different one uh, called log structured file organizations that is, doesn't actually have tuples at all, per se, at sort of a physical level. So instead of storing tuples in pages, in a log-structured system, we're actually going to store only log records, right? So let's say I have a log file, and every single time I make a change in my database, I insert a record, delete a record, update a record, I'll, I'll store a new, I'll append a new log record to the end of the file, right? And again, yes, you can organize the log file on a bunch of pages, right? But the it, we're not actually storing raw tuples. And so anytime we have an insert, we just put the whole tuple in, in a log record. For a delete, we'll just mark the tuple as being deleted. Uh, and then we do an update. We only have to store the, the delta, the things that actually change. So I have 20 attributes and I don't update one. I only have to store the change for that one attribute. Right? So inserting data is, is really fast because, or making changes to data is really fast because you're just appending to the log file. And there's another example of what I said before where people design database systems in some ways to, to try to maximize the number of sequential access to the storage device. In this case here, appending to the log file, I mean, by defini definition, it's sequential. Because you're, you're appending new records and it's always being written out in sequential order. So what's an obvious challenge in a log structured organization? Reading right, reading, exactly, right? So the way you have to read is now you essentially have to go backwards in the log and find the entry that you're looking for. So let's say I have a select query. I want to find where, the, give me the tuple where, where the ID equals one. I have to go look at every single entry in reverse order and find the latest entry that corresponds to one. Now in this case here, I only have an insert for one. So as soon as I find that insert, then I know that I have the whole tuple. But it may be the case that I come across an update for that record first. And then I have to keep going because I, I don't know what the rest of the values are because until I find the, the insert record, right? So log structured uh, databases are really, really fast for writes, potentially slower for, for reads. And so the way they can overcome this is that uh, you can build indexes in memory that actually point to offsets in the log so that if you know you're looking for a particular tuple, instead of having to do a brute force scan to look at all the log entries, you just jump to the one that you're looking for. So we can jump to this index where ID equals one and not have to look at the, the other ones. And then another thing that they'll also do is periodically compact the log, basically just take all the log entries and flatten it down to just be uh, the actual tuple itself, right? 
So this is much different than, 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 than everything we'll talk about in this, in this course, at least in terms of, of storing things on, on disk, because we don't really have tuples in the same sense of, of the, uh, of, in, in a heap file. But I would say this is actually becoming very more common now. So HBase and Cassandra use this. Uh, LevelDB was a log structure database system built by, uh, by Google. And then RocksDB is the sort of Facebook optimized version of LevelDB. Um, yes? Would you use this log structure file organization just for like the logging part of a database that otherwise used like page directory file structure? So this question is, could you use a log structure database file organization um, to just manage the logging component of a regular heap file database system? Uh, you could, but like there's a bunch of things that it's the bunch of things that this thing provides that you don't need. You don't need indexes to jump to locations in the log. Um, typically, also to uh, the you know the the logging scheme or the and the, and the the database storage on disk and the concurrent control scheme. Those things are so tightly intertwined. It's really hard to say like, all right, I'm going to take this piece from this system, that piece from that system. It's really hard to break these things apart. So everybody, everybody essentially just writes their own, right? Uh, I mean, we can talk about, this, talk about this later, but uh, a lot of times when people do new, new database startups, they take Postgres and sort of try to rip out the pieces that they just need, because you don't maybe need all the other stuff. We tried this. It's really hard, because things are just so intertwined, right? So yeah, it, it, it wouldn't make sense to say, I'm going to build a new database system, but I'm going to use RocksDB for, this, for the, the logging. Right? You, you, it doesn't make sense. You, RocksDB does way more than just that, right? It's a good question, though. OK, so, so I'll maybe talk a little bit about the log structured stuff later on in the semester. Uh, but I think it's good for you guys to be aware that it exists and how it differs from, from the, sort of the heap file things that we're talking about. Um, and when we talk about logging recovery later on, a lot of the same concepts will apply, apply here. There's a bunch of extra metadata that I'm not showing in these log records that they'll have to maintain as well. And we have to maintain them uh, also in a, in a heap file system. OK, so now we know how to design the, the, the files and keep track of our pages. The next question is how, how are we actually going to store data in these pages? right? Um, so again, for this, we're, only, we're not going to talk about the, the, the log structure stuff. It's only for the heap files. So every page is going to contain a header. And this header is going to contain metadata about its contents. So for example, it'll contain the size of the page, the checksum of its contents, so that if you know you come back and whether you actually have a valid page or not, um, which again, also the file system does, but the data system has to do this as well, uh, to keep track of like maybe what version of the system actually wrote to this page, and that way if you upgrade your system, you know how to actually, and you update your page layout, you know how to, to, to convert it. Um, there's also a bunch of extra stuff about transaction visibility, about whether the contents of this page are visible uh, to other transactions or the queries. Again, that's more of a focus when we talk about concurrency control later on. Um, and again, I already talked about before about how uh, some data systems like Oracle, for example, want these pages to be self-contained. So everything you need to know about how to understand what's in this page has to be end up be, being stored in, in the header. All right, so now the question is, how do we actually want to store tuples in this page? All right, we have a page header. We're always going to have that. Now the question is, where do, where do we actually put tuples? So a some simplistic straw man idea was just to be, let's just append new tuples from the, the top to the bottom uh, every single time we want to insert something new, right? So what's, what's the problem with this? What's that? Deletion. Right, deletion, right? So say, say I, I, I delete this middle guy here, and now I want to insert a new tuple. Ideally, we want it to go there, because otherwise we'll just have a bunch of you know, empty holes in our pages and we're wasting space. Uh, but how do we keep track of where these holes are? Well, maybe I have a bitmap that says, all right, I have, uh, I, you know, I, I, I keep track of what positions I can, I can have free space, and I check the bitmap when I write into it, right? So there's ways to get around that. But what's another obvious problem with this? The size of the tuple grows. Exactly, yes. 
Uh, so these are all, um, in my example, they're all fixed length. So in the case of here, when I deleted tuple 2 and I put tuple 4, it was the same size. It was fixed length. But now if I have a variable length tuple, it may not fit in tuple 4. The, 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 tuple 4 may not fit in that slot, and I may not have to put it at the end. So now I can't have this clean abstraction of, or clean, clean offset so I know how to jump exactly to a particular tuple because they're always going to be the same size. Right? We said we could do that with pages because the pages are always going to be fixed size, but clearly tuples can't be. So the way people solve this is the most common technique is what's, what are called slotted pages. And the way to th think about slotted pages is that uh, we're going to have the header we had before, but now we're going to have this extra array at the top that correspond to slots. And these slots are going to specify offsets into, the, into the, the, the page of where to find the tuple data. And so the slot array will start at the top. The, the fixed length and variable length tuple will start at the bottom. Right? So the slot array will grow, th grow this direction, and then the, the tuple array will, will grow in that direction. And you can keep allocating new tuples or keep putting new tuples in, in your, in your your page, as long as you still have space, right? Again, these are just pointers to the, the, the starting position of that offset for each tuple. So the example that I showed before with Postgres, where it had a record ID, uh, and then after I ran the vacuum where it reorganized the page, it could then change that, that, that uh, the, you know, the offset. Uh, it's essentially referring to the slot there. So in that particular example, uh, it actually did a major, major reorganization. So it, it got, new, got assigned new slot IDs. But in theory, I could reorganize the page and keep the same tuples in the same slots and just change their offsets. And I wouldn't have to change any other part of the system. Right, so this is just, again, adding another abstraction layer uh, in the disk manager from the rest of the parts of the database system where we, the other parts don't have to care exactly how to go find the, the tuple that you're looking for. It just knows I have a slot number and the slot number can then be, the slot array will tell me where to find the, tu the tuple that I want. Right? So again, it allows us to, to have indirection and reorganize things without having to break other parts of the system. All right, so now we understand how to store pages in files. We understand how to, uh, to keep track of them. We understand what the pages are going to look like. But now we've got to talk about how, what, what tuples look like. Right? So in the example I just showed before, right, the tuple is just I'm, you know, it's the box. right? There's, not, there's nothing there to say what, what's actually inside of it. So now we're going to talk about what the tuples are actually going to look like. So again, the way to think about a tuple at the implementation level inside of our database system is that it's just a sequence of bytes. And it's up for the database system to actually interpret those bytes based on the schema of the database or the table to know it's this type and therefore it has this length and I know how to convert it from those bytes into the actual value that you're looking for, like the human readable value. So in every tuple, there's going to be a header. Uh, again, the page has a header and the tuples have headers for themselves. And the header is going to keep track of things like the visibility, like for concurrency control, uh, whether it's been marked as deleted, um, but also keep track of maybe it was very common as a bitmap to say which attributes in my tuple are, are set to null, right? Because a null is a weird value. It, you know, you need a way to, you, you know, you can't just sort of set all ones to say that's null because that's actually a valid value. So most systems actually store a separate bitmap to say if the attribute at this offset is, is that bit set to true, then we know everything's null. So it's important to note, note here is that in the header, we're not actually storing anything about the contents of our, of our tuple, the contents of its attributes, right? Because all that information, from when, we, you know, when we call it create table, that gets stored in the data systems catalogs, which we'll talk about later. But it's this other location that keeps track of the metadata about what the data looks like. So we don't need to embed in every single tuple, you have these number of attributes, and there are these types, and they have this name. That's all in, a, in another location. In some of the NoSQL systems, when we talked about the column family data model, or in, in JSON, like in, like in MongoDB, they can't do that. They have to have, since every tuple could have a different schema, they have to embed the schema in the header. In our case, we don't have to do that because we have a rigid schema that's defined on the table. So now we have to talk about how we're actually going to store the actual underlying bytes for every attribute. So typically what happens is the, whatever order you call create table and you, and you list all your columns, 
That's how the data system is going to store those, those tuples. Right? So if I have columns A, B, C, D, E in the, in the sort of byte array for my tuple, it'll, it'll store them in that order. And there's no reason you have to do this, right? Uh, this is simply just done for software engineering reasons, and you don't have to do an extra in, in direction map every time to figure out where the actual the tuple that you're looking for is located. Um, but again, the relational model doesn't say this, that you always have to do this. Right? And there, in the case of an in-memory system, sometimes there's cases where you actually maybe want to change the ordering of how things are actually physically stored so that you, you word align the bytes for your tuple. In our case, we'll ignore that, and we'll just assume that everything, everything is fine. So now for the individual attributes, the way they're going to be represented is usually uh, defined by what's called the IEEE 754 standard. Who here has heard of this? One, two, three, right, a few. All right, so there's this, there's this standard that's out, it's been out for a while, that basically specifies how the, a, a, a processor will represent in bits things like integers, floats, decimals, numbers, uh, things like that. So all the processors will, 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 will know how to write data out in memory that looks like this. So every single database system just uses those things. Like when you declare an int in C or C++, right, in memory it's stored with a bunch of bits, represented an integer. That's, that's specified by that, the IEEE 754 standard. So for most database systems, all the bits will be stored exactly, exactly the same, right? Uh, but it depends, obviously, whether you're, you're big endian or little endian, it may get reversed around. So for integers, uh, big int, small int, tiny int, we'll just use the standard. For the var chars, we usually have the, the, the first couple bytes will specify the length of the var char field, followed by its contents. And then for, for date and time, timestamps, that can vary between different data systems. Usually they always store it as the, you know, if it's, if it's a Unix system, the number of seconds or microseconds or milliseconds since the Unix epoch. Um, sometimes you have more complicated uh, structs for these kind of things, um, but for our purposes, we don't care about. The one I sort of want to focus on is how we actually going to store decimals. Right, so because there's two types of decimals in, in SQL, in databases. There are uh, sort of the, the IEEE 754 standard decimals, the floating point numbers, and then there's what are called fixed point decimals that the database systems can, can support. So, um, again, for, for, for for floating point numbers, we'll just use sort of the native types in C and C++, and then we're just storing them exactly how it's specified in the standard, right? If you want to have, uh, if, if you don't care about rounding errors, then this is okay. Uh, if, you, if you do care about rounding errors, then you, 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 you want to use what are, what are called fixed point numbers. Um, I don't have time for a demo, but um, take my word for it. If you use fixed point numbers, they're, they're slower, but you, they're accurate. Floating point numbers are faster, but you can have rounding errors, right? And sort of give you an example of what does this look like. Say I take this, this little simple C program and I run it on my laptop. Uh, what should be 0 0.3 as the output ends up being, you know, the, these bizarre things. And you get different things in different ways, right? You can try to take 0 0.3 and cast it to a, a floating point with printf, or you can actually do the, the, the arithmetic and, get, and you end up getting widely different numbers, right? And this is because the IEEE's that 754 standard has to allow for rounding errors because you can't store exact, precise uh, floating point numbers on, on your processor. So the way we fix this in our database system is to use what we call fixed precision numbers, where uh, instead of storing um, instead of just storing just like a single number, we'll store a bunch of metadata about what that number is, and we know where the decimal point should be, we know what's on the right hand and the left hand side, and we know how to cast this. So the way to sort of think about this is like storing a varchar, sort of a byte sequence, but we know how to interpret those bytes to get the exact thing that we're looking for. So to give you an example of what this looks like in Postgres, so this is the actual Postgres code where they define a numeric type, and they define it as a struct, and there's all this extra stuff that they're storing just for a single number, right? Say so you know, four 32-bit integers, and then there's a pointer to, to, to something else. Um, right, and that's just pointing to itself, for, or to a, a char array. So, oh, I'm missing a demo, that's all right. Um, so I, I'll, I'll just say that, uh, 
when you actually do arithmetic on numerics, these fixed point numbers, they'll be much, much slower, but they're guaranteed to be accurate. And then depending on what you want, the data system will store those bytes in, in the tuple for you. So we're out of time, but as, uh, the last thing I'll say is how do we actually handle large values, right? Uh, so most database systems don't allow you to have a tuple size that exceeds the, 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 the size of a page. Um, and so if you have really large attributes, then you don't want to store it directly in, in the page with the tuple. You want to store what are called overflow pages. So these, think of this as like extra pages we have in our database where in the regular tuple and the regular pages, they'll have a pointer or you know, some, some page ID and offset to some location in an overflow page where we'll actually have the varchar data. In Postgres, this is called toast. Uh, and you get this for free anytime the, the thing you're trying to store is larger than two kilobytes. In MySQL, uh, if the thing you're trying to store is larger than half the size of a page, so anything larger than eight kilobytes, will be stored in this, this separate thing, right? Yes? This question is, where would an overflow page be located? On disk, where else, right? Right, so it doesn't, so it doesn't, you typically wouldn't store it in the exact same file as the, as the, the, the data pages. His question is, does it mean you have to read extra pages? Of course, yes. So, if, so we can do a demo of this. We're out of time, though. Like, if I store something really large, uh, then I do a select and it's not in memory, it has to go first go get the data page where the tuple's located, and it says, aha, I have something that's, that's in an overflow page, then it has to do another fetch and get to the overflow page. Right? Uh, I don't know whether this is still true. My SQL had, used to have problems where they couldn't uh, use multiple overflow pages for multiple tuples. So if you had to say maybe make, uh, if, you, if you had two tuples and each, each had an overflow page, you had to allocate separate overflow pages for each of, uh, each of them, even though they maybe may, may could fit in the same thing. Right? All right, so we're out of time, but as, as a preview for what I'll pick up on, uh, on, on Wednesday's class is that just like before when I said the relational model doesn't specify that, you know, how things can be ordered on disk, it doesn't also actually specify how we're actually going to store tuples at all. And so in all the examples that I showed before, and I'm showing in, in this class, I showed you that, the, that all the attributes for a tuple are just stored contiguously one after another. Right? And then, you know, you have all the, the, the data for one tuple. When that tuple ends, then the next tuple starts. But there's nothing about the relational model that says that's the right way to do this, right? Because the relational model is just dealing with the logical level of the database. So, and the reason why this will matter, and what we'll pick up in the next class, is that storing the data in contiguous order like that may not actually be the best thing to do for all workloads. All right? And the preview is that maybe you actually want to store it as columns. All the data for a single attribute together in, in a single page, and then all the data for the next attribute stored in another page. So we'll stop now. When we come back on Wednesday, we'll pick up with why this actually matters. And then we'll also talk about buffer pool management and moving data back and forth between memory and disk. OK? Any questions? All right, guys, thank you. See you on Wednesday.